Like giant exclamation marks, skyscrapers punctuate the story of our urban development. People always want to reach. There's something heavenly about it, and people have wanted to race for height forever. Developed by the pioneers of architecture in the late 19th century. They were, at the time, the equivalent of our going to the moon. These magnificently designed tower giants urbanized some of the greatest cities in the world. It's about defying gravity and leaving a sign of humanity. From Chicago to London, from Tokyo to Dubai, skyscrapers have and continue to define our contemporary way of life. By 2010, the skyscraper bar was higher than ever before, and one building stood out from all the rest. Topping out at 2,717 feet, Dubai's Burj Khalifa did not bring an end to our obsession with skyscrapers. If anything, it provided a new proof of concept that pushed architects and engineers to a whole new level. There is no well-defined style anymore. Anybody is coming up with any shape and form. All of a sudden, architects started uh, trying to outdo themselves, and the trends became quite unusual. In 2014, nearly 100 skyscrapers were added to city skylines all around the globe. Everyone's curious what these things will look like. You know, what's the aspirational image of, of an architecture? Buildings aren't necessarily uh, straight up and down anymore. They're twisting and they're turning and they're doing all sorts of things. Every tower is competing with each other, twisting and turning and, and tapering, you know, desperately trying to stand out. And really, tall buildings need to do more to not only stand out, but also to fit in. Even though economies across the world were crumbling due to the global financial crisis, the Middle East averted disaster, and Dubai survived in style. Its economy was shaken, but not stirred. We were last there in 2008, just before everything fell off a financial cliff edge. Um, and now it's into a different phase of, of, of development and a different phase of tall buildings. Its building industry set off on a new, more sensible course. The focus? Several government-backed initiatives, including improvements to infrastructure. These uh, disparate centers are now getting joined together. And the key to that really has been that the infrastructure is now creating the links between those centers. So it's becoming a proper city in that regard. And is it a city that has the same piecemeal growth and walkability that a city that's been around for a thousand years like London has? No, but it's been around for 30 years, and that's starting to come. One extraordinary building momentarily delayed by the financial crisis was the 1,005-foot-tall Cayenne Tower, located on Dubai Marina. Designed by architectural firm Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, it's the world's tallest tower, with a twist. It's uh, one of the most dramatic buildings in Dubai, and it goes through a 90-degree uh, rotation of the floor plan from the bottom of the building to the top of the building. I call that extreme engineering. I remember one of our earlier schemes, we had like the top and the bottom and kind of straight lines, and I was looking at it, and it became clear that every floor was different. And I thought, was, well, that'll drive the rental agent nuts. So then we went on a, on a mission to figure out how can we make every floor identical? And so uh, we came up with a system that, that does that. The building wants to literally try to screw itself and become straight again. So you're, you're not only counteracting wind and earthquake and other environmental forces, you actually have to support in a very contorted uh, manner the gravity loads, the actual weight of the building. So we combined a very old system, which is a tubular system for the outside, with a very stiff core. And it's an elegant solution, but it's in another way, it's a brute force solution. And then, then the perimeter uh, framing was in form work that you'd pick up and then rotate 1.3 degrees for the next floor, pick up, rotate 1.3 degrees. So, but every floor was the same. You know, I like to tell people that, yes, we innovate on uh, groundbreaking structures, but 
We also try to do things that have been done before and just reorganize them. If there's one place as an engineer and architect and you want to get your design built, it's Dubai. They have the resources, they have the go-to ability to get it done, and they move quickly from point A to point B. So for them, it's pride of their country, pride of their city, and the financial aspects work for them. While innovative exterior designs are certainly a selling point, the features inside of the buildings and how they affect their occupants are vital to creating a successful structure. Recent studies done by scientists show that happiness is very relative. But 50% of our perception of happiness depends on our genes. 40% is how our brain perceives our environment and 10% is on our circumstances. So as architects and engineers, our biggest achievement is to go to that 40% where the brain perceives our environment. And that's why you're paying for architects to design buildings which are interesting and change the mood of the people inside them. That will lead to forms, to shapes of building which are different, but they're responding, they're being interpreted to a real life need. One city that's already steps ahead in ensuring the health and well-being of its residents is Sydney. Set on the world's most exquisite natural harbor with a near perfect climate, Sydney is consistently ranked among the top 10 most livable cities on the planet. In the city of Sydney, there's a unique piece of legislation that means that any new major building needs to go through a what's called a design competition, where architects from around the world compete to produce the best design. And you're starting to see some really interesting, evocative and sustainable buildings emerging on the cityscape. One of the first buildings to emerge from this initiative was One Central Park, a two-tower complex by Foster and Partners. Green is living. Uh, on the facades of the building and it has this kaleidoscope which reflects sunlight you know, down into the public spaces below. Do you know what's happening in the faith of Islam, Christianity and Judaism? So in all those three religions, they believe heaven is a place almost like a garden, a place where human and nature can thrive together. So we have to kind of go back to there to understand holistically from the thing we see, from the air we breathe, and from the sound we hear, how we incorporate more of the nature back to our urban environment to create this habitat for humans in the future. These examples, they get encouraged. The benchmarks are there. You know, there's proof that it can be done. And I would say at least the clients I'm working with are, are much more receptive uh, to doing, you know, these more sort of daring designs. Building to the sky is not a 20th century innovation. The Egyptian pharaohs did it on a monumental scale. The Maya in Central America are known for their intricate designs. And right through Asia, pagodas continue to represent the cosmic link between heaven and earth. As far back as you know, thousands of years BC with their kind of pyramids, we've always wanted to be higher and more powerful than our rivals. You could think of the medieval cathedral as a symbol of power of the Catholic Church. It's also, of course, a symbol of pride. It's a pride of the town city paying for this enormous edifice to show that their town was better than any other. You've got things like towers in Renaissance Bologna, where different families would build a kind of taller tower to demonstrate their wealth. It was all about economic power, whether it was the church or whether it was those families or the lords. And today, it's more about capitalism and displaying uh, the power and wealth and the iconography of a, a country or a city to a global audience. Where people are proud to show how important their city is because it's got skyscrapers, because it's got a big skyline. And one city in particular set the bar high with the use of a new building material to create one of the most iconic structures of all time.
Since their earliest days, skyscrapers have been a sure way for cities to show the rest of the world just what they've got. And in the late 1880s, one city that was eager to demonstrate its industrial importance was Paris, proud host of the 1889 World Fair. To showcase their expertise, engineers worked with a new material that was lighter and cheaper than stone, iron. The result was none other than the Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower was really the kind of precursor to the super tall skyscraper because it demonstrated to us just what kind of heights were achievable with a lightweight metal frame. Eiffel was a contractor. He built things. He had a firm that was the best builder in iron. So he was at the cutting edge of iron technology. The Eiffel Tower actually wasn't designed by Eiffel at all. It was designed by two engineers working in his firm. They invited an architect in who took their rather boring design and added a rather beautiful arch. And Eiffel was so taken by this design that he bought the patent off them. Structurally, it was important because he visualized the technical challenge to go vertically. It symbolizes the vertical cantilever, the shape of the tower, the enlarges itself on the ground, tells that if you want to build high, you have to anchor the building to the ground. You look around the bottom, and the name of all the sort of famous men, they're all mathematicians and engineers, and that, there's a celebration of engineering that was going on at the time. 12,000 pieces of prefabricated wrought iron and 7 million rivets made up this staggering structure. The patience that went into engineering the tower was incredible, especially considering its intended lifespan. You know, it was a temporary structure. When it was first unveiled, a lot of Parisians didn't like it. They said it was ugly, it was too sort of techno. It looked like a machine. It didn't look like Paris as they knew it. But then it became so loved, it's still there today, and of course, become the symbol of Paris. The blending of old and new buildings isn't always easy, and the task has proven to be a challenge in a city with as much history as London. London has always been dense. Even when the buildings have been low, the streets are narrow, it's still dense. But to achieve that density means growing vertically. And when new structures begin to pop up in older cities, they're often given a nickname, usually a sign that the building has gained the public's approval. The Leadenhall Tower, or the, the cheese grater to give it its moniker, is a tall building in the centre of London that leans back. And it, it does so to get out of the way, essentially, of the, the silhouette of St Paul's Cathedral, much like many tall buildings in London that, that duck and dive to kind of get out of the way of protected viewing corridors. At 736 feet tall, with its angled facade, articulated steel frame, and 70,000 panes of glass, the cheese grater became the tallest building in London upon its completion in 2014. It was engineered more like a bridge than a building due largely to its location. Due to a very constrained site in the centre of London with not much space for loading and unloading, much of the building, over 80%, was built off-site and prefabricated. What that meant is that construction was quicker, construction was safer, and the building was kind of bolted together. The top of the building was constructed as a detached tower eliminating the need for extra fire protection and allowing its steel bones to become as much of a feature inside the building as out. The frame, the structure is not hidden away, it's exposed on the outside. The north-facing core is glazed and allows us to see the elevators moving up and down and provides a degree of readability or legibility to the city. It's fantastic to look at, it's, it's quite staggering, but also it's fairly easy to walk around and it's inviting. 
you know, tall buildings need to be inviting because their scale is not conducive to pedestrians. Therefore, anything that encourages you to sort of interact with them is a good thing, and it's a responsibility of designers to try and do that. While some buildings in London immediately fit in with their surroundings, others took a while to gain the public's trust. In the 21st century, many skyscrapers in the UK dared to defy the buildings of the past to achieve new architectural firsts. One thoroughly modern commercial building in London is the Shard, currently the city's tallest tower. Despite reaching impressive heights and delivering incredible views, many were quick to judge. The Shard was described by English heritage as a stake through the heart of London. I'm biased, I'm emotionally attached to that building, having spent 10 years of my career on it. Not many buildings split the public's opinion quite like Renzo Piano's neo-futuristic masterpiece. This 1,016-foot skyscraper has a high-performance triple-skin facade, 28 floors of office space, several restaurants, a luxury hotel occupying 18 floors, and exclusive residences. and it still is the tallest building in Western Europe. So people naturally assume, because it's the tallest, therefore it's the most expensive. But actually, it isn't, and it wasn't. And th there are some fundamental reasons for that. One is that its tapering form makes it structurally a very efficient building. It's got a, you know, a massive central concrete core, which means that its steel frame around that core is relatively straightforward. It's got a high degree of repetition in its facades. It's something like 85% repeated, so that the unit cost of those external walls comes right down. It's got a pretty tight floor-to-floor -floor dimension, so you can get more space into that envelope. Yeah, you know, it, it really works its economies of scale really well. 95% of the materials used in the construction were recycled, as was 20% of the building's steelwork. The entire ground floor was designed to involve and include the public. I think the Shard is a particularly beautiful piece of architecture, but when it was going up, you would think the world was ending. People begin to recognize and assimilate and love particular skyscrapers, all loathe them, I mean, but they recognize, and that is why you make them strange shapes like the gherkin or the shard or the cheese grater, these skyscrapers which get affectionate nicknames to the point that developers now nickname their own buildings when they put them in for planning application in the hope that the public will call their building the walkie-talkie building. But few in the skyscraper business appear to be holding their breath over the giant walkie-talkie, the commercial giant sending all the wrong messages from its location on Fenchurch Street. A very controversial building and one that divides opinion, but has a very sound commercial basis, so it creates more floor space at the top of the building, which is actually the more valuable space because that's where you get the views and that's where people pay extra rent. Shortly after construction was completed in 2014, locals began referring to the 36-story walkie-talkie as the walkie scorchy. Because of the shape of the tower, it was acting like a lens that was collecting all the solar energy and then projecting it to one point only. And that one point only happened to be a car park with some cars were having the fenders melting, etc. So the, the problem of tall buildings is the fact that they have to be self-contained. It has to work with its own rules, but they not always try to understand how they impact the, their environment, not only in the way they hit the ground, but in the way they also reflect the environment back to the city. The recent evolution of London's skyline is still taking locals by surprise. But on the other side of the Atlantic, New Yorkers are accustomed to the increasing number of skyscrapers. 
After all, skyscrapers have been a Manhattan staple for over a century. Nonetheless, not all New Yorkers are thrilled to see a new building pop up in the concrete jungle. New York has invented an entirely new typology in the history of the skyscraper, and that's the super slender, ultra-luxury residential tower. The best address to impress in Manhattan is 432 Park Avenue. Nestled along the newly dubbed Billionaire's Row, it's the tallest residential tower in the Western Hemisphere. The pencil-thin structure soars 1,397 feet into the sky, and the price tag for the six-bedroom, seven-bathroom penthouse is as eye-watering as the view at a cool $95 million. 157 was significantly shorter at 1,004 feet, but just as pricey. Nicknamed the Billionaire's Building, it's the first of many towers of its kind planned for 57th Street. You know, those tall residential buildings are in some senses their own market. You couldn't afford to do that, and you wouldn't want to do that unless you could sell that space for a very, very high price. So developers, what they've done is they've created a series of technologies that are related to, for example, uh, to constructing the stairwells, making them thinner, and how they erect the structure, the frame, and how they do the wind bracing. Another set of innovations include moving the plant and equipment to the lower floors. So this way, even the first apartment is guaranteed to get a decent view. And you don't waste space on the upper floors uh, housing uh, the plant and equipment. Now, they've been controversial for two reasons. One, because they cast a shadow, but they're also controversial because typically the people who live there may or may not live there full time. They may or may not feel a part of the community. It goes away from the trend of, of towers which open up and towers which are engaging to the ivory towers of exclusivity. The city is not just for the wealthy. It needs to be for everybody. And we have to make sure that the density of our future housing is inclusive and is available to a, a wide range of, of socioeconomic backgrounds. While certain neighborhoods were once coveted for their easy access to the heart of the city, today, more and more New Yorkers are opting for more sustainable and affordable living options on the outskirts of town. But in other regions, with rapidly growing populations, moving out of the city isn't always an option. In the years that followed, new projects were commissioned. Building for New York's Sea of Humanity hasn't always been easy, given the amount of people that inhabit the city and the challenges it's had to endure. One of the city's most trying times came when the Twin Towers fell on 9-11-2001. In the years that followed, new projects were commissioned, giving New York a chance to triumph over their tragedy most notably One World Trade Center. It is without doubt the tallest building in New York. After 9-11, city life was changed forever. But even though times were tough, New Yorkers were still able to adapt. Also able to adapt to their surroundings are millennials, who have recently been trading in their apartments in the most coveted zip codes, opting for spots outside of the city that give them more bang for their buck. If you ask these millennials where they want to live now, they do not want to live in Manhattan. They're going out to, you know, the frontiers of Brooklyn and Queens, and they want to live in a place with more light and air. So it's a very different world here, in this city where the skyscraper was to some extent born. With many New Yorkers opting for life outside of the city, leading architects and engineers are shifting their focus to China, thanks to their massive population boom. There's no question that building iconic new skyscrapers on top of pre-existing ones is resourceful. Creativity and innovation are limitless when working with a virtually clean slate. And what architect wouldn't want a hand in building whole cities 
from scratch. China is having a tall building boom, which makes the kind of the 1930s American skyscraper boom look, look minuscule, really. And if you look at the figures in China, it's staggering, right? So they're, they're talking about the urban billion. Uh, so the fact that they need to basically create a thousand cities of a million people. Because the growth is so great, there's the need to create brand new cities, explosion of population, explosion of economies. We found that, you know, China's used more concrete in two to three years recently than America used in the entire 20th century. So to support billions of new urban dwellers, we need massive amounts of infrastructure, massive amounts of construction on a scale of like we've never seen before. This next generation of work that's being done in China, I think is being characterized by you know, buildings which are smarter and more sustainable, which is the correct trajectory. Setting a new iconic tone for Shanghai is the tallest building in Asia, the 2,073-foot-tall Shanghai Tower by Tongji Architectural Design. The Shanghai Tower is the second tallest building in the world at 128 stories. But whereas it looks like a one large curvilinear form from the outside, but actually the architects and engineers work together in the wind tunnel to optimize that form, to minimize the amount of wind pushing on the building. And in doing so, compared to a rectilinear building, they managed to reduce the amount of wind load on the building and therefore save 20,000 tons of steel from the structure. Now that has a millions and millions of dollars of economic saving, but a huge embodied carbon saving as well. When we start working on the Shanghai Tower, we're working with the architects with a community uh, design in mind. So the thought is create common space in each zone that people can use. It's a series of nine 12-story villages stacked on top of each other, each with its own ground floor. The building the itself is like a wedding cake, a circular shape, but outside is a triangular curtain wall twisting, wrapping the tower uh, behind. So the intersection between the circular office space and the triangular curtain wall envelope create triangular atrium space almost 14, 15 story tall for a community. Not only did it reach an unprecedented height, the building set its sights on being the greenest skyscraper in the world. This building has a double scheme. The circular office space inside or the tenant space inside is an internal scheme. Outside, it was wrapped around by another curtain wall scheme, so you have a double insulation for the building. And we can recirculate the air between each scheme to make it more efficient. And also we have wind turbine at the rooftop to power the public lighting of the tower. I think what's interesting about Shanghai and Pudong is that there's a Jin Mao building. Uh, but there's also the Shanghai World Financial Center, and then there's the new Shanghai Tower. So uh, we can't read them as singular statements anymore. They're starting to become sort of skyline sort of components. And that's ultimately what makes the city super collective. It's a collective image. It's not a kind of singular statement. As the population continues to grow and people's needs are becoming more specific, developers' main focus has shifted from sheer height to quality and accommodating an increasing population that shows no signs of stopping. Megacities are essentially defined by population. 10 million inhabitants warrants the status. Half a century ago, there were only two megacities in the world, Tokyo and New York City. By 2025, there will be 39, with more than half located in Asia. Urbanization is rampant in China, with half a billion people relocating from the country to the city in a matter of decades. The new megacities are coming up, for example, in Asia. 
there isn't that kind of love affair, there isn't that uh, historical um, connection, because these cities are being built instantaneously. There is no past and no history quite often, or it's been completely swept away, bringing new context in there that anticipates a great place for people to live and be and work 50 to 100 to 200 years from now. What people are seeing, what new generations and young generations are seeing, is what they're used to anyway. So they're seeing new contemporary architecture and new super high-rise architecture and embracing it day one. There's no conflict between what they have before and what they have now because they don't know what was before. In 1979, the Pearl River Delta was substantially agricultural. Today, it is a thriving urban region, and the city of Guangzhou lies in the heart of it all. Dating back to the Ming Dynasty, Guangzhou's old city district has been transformed, with skyscrapers now lining both banks of the river. Among them, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill's extraordinary Pearl River Tower. The design of the Pearl River Tower was to have the uh, most energy efficient tall building uh, in the world. It's systems, mechanical systems, a very, very efficient ways of dealing with getting the energy around to the building through uh, water rather than blowing air. And then the building itself has braces going up the sides to, to brace it against the, the wind that's coming uh, both directions. Engineering. Innovation and green technology define this neo-futuristic 71-story tower. Cleverly shaped to channel the wind into the building's mechanical floors in order to generate energy. The amount of energy that's lost from the original power plant to the users is huge. If you can generate your electricity local, you save a great deal. The drive to create more sustainable, energy-efficient buildings is clearly motivated by China's need to overcome one of its most significant environmental problems, air pollution. We hear about pollution in Beijing and the sky is uh, nearly black because of the, the pollution. But in the, the kind of guidelines that they're giving to us as designers, they can be very aggressive and very innovative really put pressure on us to innovate. How can you use less energy or respect the ecologies in the cities where you're working? A major concern in Shenzhen, another city within the vast Pearl River Delta megatropolis is its dense population. Attracting more migrants than any other city in China, it has become the Silicon Valley of the East. Finance is big here too, and it's reflected in a very literal way, on the skyline. The standout skyscraper, towering above the rest, is the 115-story Ping An International Financial Center. So the challenge with Ping An was how do we take something which is so dense, so kind of heavy, so full of machines, right, and make it look light? So kind of like as a design concept, rather than starting from the ground and pushing up, it was to say, okay, we start with the point in the sky, like I'm holding a, a handkerchief, and we just let it drape down from that point. And then that gave rise to the final form. And if you go to Shenzhen, you see the tower. Yes, it's very tall, but it does feel light. It feels graceful. As we inch closer to the halfway point of the 21st century, when two-thirds of the global population will likely be living in urban environments, the rise of city skylines around the world is inevitable. The only question hanging over the industry is how much higher can we actually go? As time goes on, skyscrapers continue to evolve and dominate our urban skylines. And architects and engineers have exceeded expectations with their progressive and innovative creations. But there is no I in team. It's a collective effort. 
If you give me a project tomorrow for one mile tall, we will work together uh, with the team, with our solutions to give you a one mile tall building. And people are always innovative. Engineers and scientists, they are innovative. Architects have visions, you know. So I think this is not going to stop. That's the future of tall buildings. There's no doubt we can build taller. So the more significant ethical question is, should we? The only limit on how tall we can go, really, is this one. Who's going to pay for it and why would you? People are starting to realize that living in these tall buildings, there's something about losing the aspect of what's going on at the ground plane. If you can imagine living on the thousand meters up in the air, you've got very little physical connection or even mental connection with people on the ground, which is not so attractive to a lot of people. Uh, so you live in, you're almost like you're living in a separate world. So I would argue that the tall building now is more a social and urban uh, challenge. There will still be plenty of hurdles and high bars to vault over for those responsible for tall building design. Because every time a glass ceiling shatters, a new prototype emerges. The Jeddah Tower will be an architectural and engineering marvel. The first tall building to break the, the one kilometer high barrier. But we still don't know exactly how tall it will be as that's kept under wraps to make sure no competing towers try and break its record. This super tall skyscraper, symbolizing Saudi Arabia's great wealth and power, was commissioned by billionaire prince Al-Walid bin Talal, then the richest man in the Middle East. We've been working on it since 2010, and the motivations for that are primarily just a vision of Jeddah and the city. The 3,280-foot tower is 167 floors of cloud-piercing elegance, at least 568 feet taller than the Burj Khalifa. The foundations were a big issue. It's built on, I would call it, it's rock, but it's not bedrock. The load is gradually taken into the ground. The foundation elements are the board piles. They're 1.8 meters in diameter, and they reach 105 meters in depth. So well over 300 feet uh, into the ground. The big challenge is the wind. So the wind is pushing on the building and, and, and causing a lateral kind of instability. And so we need to resist the wind. And the Jeddah Tower does that in a number of different ways. Firstly, it has a Y-shaped plan. And that Y-shaped plan means the building can be quite broad at the base and quite narrow and pointy at the top. And it means its slenderness ratio is only one to 10. Here in the United States, we like to call it a Neil Armstrong moment for architects and engineers. It's unprecedented in terms of scale, in terms of construction. And uh, it took uh, roughly three years to design. And uh, all, everything was focused on trying to design a structure and architecture that could be constructed. And once this lunar mission is accomplished, the greatest minds in the skyscraper game will likely set their sights on Mars, inspiring a whole new generation to outdream their visionary predecessors. I think I think this system like that can go up to about 1.2 kilometers. And beyond that, I think you need to invent another creature, a new animal. And I've got some ideas. So if anybody out there wants to uh, do, uh, do like a mile high, just, just you know, give me a ring. It's difficult to visualize what cities might look like 100 years from now. It's hard enough imagining the form they will take in a matter of decades. By 2050, another 2.5 billion people will have urbanized their way of life. That largest um, human migration and human history is being engineered by a, a set of values which has embraced the skyscraper as the image of the future. What we would want is that skyscraper to be part of the urban realm, part of the master planning of cities. Potentially, everything in our future will shift from a horizontal to a vertical plane. 
It's illuminating to look back in time, even as we push to the future, to reflect on the first generation of skyscrapers and their legacy in shaping our lives. From Chicago to London, from Tokyo to Dubai, urbanization is not slowing down. So the tall building industry continues to boom, inspiring even greater creativity and technological innovation. It seems the race to build to the sky is far from over. For the architecturally inclined, it's just getting started. I think we will see vertical farming where we're growing the proportion of our food in the city, reducing transportation miles of food uh, and reducing our reliance uh, on agriculture out at the peripheries. I think we will see vertical hospitals. I think we will see uh, vertical cemeteries even as more and more of our life and even our death is embracing this vertical high density realm. I see the future of tall buildings as being clusters of, of mixed use towers where you may live in one tower but be able to commute quite a short distance by foot, by bike, by public transport to another mixed use tower in relatively close proximity. So how do we design our future cities with future skyscrapers where each skyscraper is a microcosm of the city and how do we connect that with people around us or world around us? Tall buildings will be harvesting energy, they will be green, they'll be offering an incredible lifestyle. You, you will have the ultimate privacy that you desire, the community to be able to engage with other like-minded people to mingle. They will offer a better lifestyle because our level of expectation is, is rising all the time. We need to treat the land and that as a very precious commodity. Like water in the desert, you've got to be very, take care of it so when you have it, develop it and develop it properly and densely. You need to build homes, you need to build places for people to work, but you need to concentrate those things rather than just let them sprawl. There is a global demand for this and we just, we are recognizing the age in which we live.